New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, very excited. The great, one of my favorite WWE superstars um, as a human being, as a wrestler. Um, and the, she's the best. And now, after just completing more history in her career, Natalia is here. How are you, Natalia? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. You're now, you believe that you are now a full on one name superstar, correct? I, you know what? You can just call me Natty. And you do, but you don't, but like your your last name at times, optional if you want to yeah. pay respect to your great name, but your name so alone rings bells. I mean, you can just be Natty I, or you Natalia. Know what? I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, first of all, you can see uh, Natty and all the other great WWE superstars tonight, Monday Night Raw, Long Island, uh, one of my favorite venues for wrestling. Um, the former Nassau Coliseum. Tickets are available at the box office starting at 20 bucks. Um, so if you want to go to Monday Night Raw tonight, Natty will be there. But Natty literally just got home from a pretty crazy whirlwind weekend uh, or late week in Saudi Arabia. What was the experience like the first ever women's match in Saudi Arabia? Take us through your experience. Uh, gosh, I mean, it was it was such an incredible experience. It was my second trip to Saudi Arabia. I went to Jeddah in May um, and we were hopeful in May uh, it was myself and Alexa Bliss. We were hopeful in May that we would get a chance to have the first women's match, but it didn't happen. So we were kind of, you know, again, I, I don't want to say disappointed, but just keeping our fingers crossed that eventually it would happen. And then on this trip, um, myself and Lacey Evans were asked to come. And again, we we knew, you know, hey, it might not happen, but you know, make sure you guys have gear, make sure that you, you know, we have everything we need for this match. And so when it finally did happen, when we got the note, like when it, when it was announced, when Michael Cole announced it at the press conference, that's when I knew that it was really happening. And w what was um, the actual experience like um, preparing for the match there, um, having it there, you know, just uh, obviously this is a very unique circumstance and the way uh, women are, a scene and treated in Saudi Arabia has been a, a thing of obvious, obviously a great amount of controversy and conversation. You were actually there and experienced yeah. it. Um, and obviously I know you can't speak for the experience of women who live in Saudi Arabia, right. but for you guys, take us through that experience. I just had such a, I had such a good experience there. I mean, not only was the hummus the best damned hummus I've ever had. Really? Is that, is that true? Um, is this <laughs> worth a trip to Saudi Arabia? <laughs> it could be worth a trip okay. to Saudi Arabia for the hummus. How long's the flight? Uh, only like 15 hours. All right. Well, listen, for really good hummus, I mean, listen. For really good hummus, it's worth it. But um, the people, everybody was just so nice to us. And I feel, I, you know, when we landed, the, it's a very clean, beautiful country. Mm -hmm. And um, not only was the food good, the people were extremely nice to us. I felt like, you know, because WWE has such a great relationship with Saudi Arabia, I just felt like I, I we were just treated so well. And um, I... Like, there were so many women there, too, that embraced us so much. Even after the match, you know, I said to Lacey, I said, after the match, we can walk up the ramp together, but we couldn't even make it to the ramp because everybody was hugged. All these women, front row, we were just being so embraced by children and women. I know, it took, like, like on the on if you watch on the WWE Network, there's the match and then there's a segment for the post-match because it lasted that long. Like, it was that much of a, a thing. It, we couldn't, we just, everybody was just embracing us so much. And that was really the, that's what I took away from the experience more than anything was that the, the people were so excited and so ready. Even when they played a little clip of uh, Lacey and I before the show, they played a little package. They played a little clip before our match. Mm -hmm. The crowd erupted. The whole arena erupted. It was over 40,000 people erupted and cheers when our graphics were put on the screen. And so that was a good, to me, that was a good, like, okay, you know, that was testing the waters to see whether they were gonna like, cause at this point they'd never seen women perform. So to be able to give, to get that kind of reaction and then to walk out through the curtain in front of people that had never seen women have a wrestling match. Again, I was scared because I was like, I hope that they, uh, not scared of being there, but scared that they wouldn't react. Yeah, and of course. Well, biggest... and also it's a different, it, things can get lost in translation. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I mean I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Like, for example, uh, the end of the main event, um, the Bray Wyatt-Seth match, I thought that was like a little tough for that audience 
to if you're not a really regular audience in a live show th that match finished outside the ring it was up on the ramp it was all over the place yeah an american crowd yeah. would process it one way yes a crowd in saudi yeah. arabia process it another way yeah. it's a different kind of thing so i know what you mean things do get interpreted differently and that's always my biggest fear in any arena around the world where whenever i'm wrestling anywhere whether it's china whether it's in new york whether it's in Alabama or Florida or Australia, I'm always afraid that people won't react. And that's, I think as a performer, we walk out. I remember one time Arn Anderson saying, like, you always have to just assume that people won't know who you are, so tell the story again. When you walk out, if you're good, explain why you're good. If you're bad, explain why you're bad. Re-educate the audience in case they don't know who you are. So I never like to rely on the fact that Maybe these people in Saudi Arabia right. don't know who I am. Yeah, so but they did, and they cared, and they loved, they loved the moment, and they embraced the moment, and it was it was truly one of the most life changing experiences I've ever had in in professional wrestling. It's been great to watch your your last couple of years. I mean, I think as as someone who knows you personally and yeah. has watched your journey, I know there have been ups and downs, and you've really been a testament to just sticking it out like there have been times when you've thought what am i doing what's happening with me right now um I i'm not in the spot everyone has a moment where they're like i'm not doing what i should be doing right and you just sort of always manage to keep your head down keep working and it keeps coming back around have you felt that way about the last few years of your journey that you've kind of been in a spot necessarily you didn't know you'd always be in i felt like um it's taken me there, I don't believe in overnight success stories. I just think that like people don't realize the work that goes into people. Like look at Taylor Swift. You know, she wasn't just because she's young. Like she's been doing plugging away at this since she was in her early teens, if not earlier. Mm -hmm. Look at Ronda Rousey. She'd been doing judo since she was eight years old. You know, where she literally training every single day for hours and hours and hours a day since she was a little girl. And I look at myself, and I I started wrestling professional wrestling in my teens. And I didn't get hired in WWE until I was 25, 26. Um, and then it took it took a long time for women to actually be recognized in a way that we are now with this women's evolution. And to me, I always knew, I always knew that I would get my chance. And I always, the second that WWE announced that they were doing shows in Saudi Arabia, I remember saying to our boss, I, Vince McMahon, I want to be the first woman to wrestle in Saudi Arabia. I want to do this because I knew the magnitude that it would have and just like the women's evolution. I I I know there's certain moments. You just know you just know it. Like my match that I had with Charlotte Flair in 2014. Before we had that match, I knew I understood the gravity of that match. I knew having Bret Hart, Ric Flair, I knew that having somebody of Charlotte's potential, I knew even though she wasn't where she wanted to be at that point or she didn't really even know who she was at that point, there's just certain pivotal moments in your career where you know, hey, this is like a real turning point. And I, I feel like in the last few years, I'm finally, I've finally started to really hit my stride. I look at Bret Hart's career. I was talking to Seth Rollins about this, and mm -hmm. he was like, he was blown away by this. I said... Brett didn't start to hit his stride until he was 40. The best years of Bret Hart's career, the peak of his career was when he was 40 years old. And Seth's like, you're kidding me. So Seth like Googled it and was like, oh my God, you're right. Brett was having the, like he was having the matches of his career, like in 97, 96, like those, those matches with like Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels, that was like when he was in his early 40s. So for me, I'm 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 really really hitting my stride. I look at the match I had with Becky Lynch at SummerSlam. I, you know, this moment with Lacey Evans. Like, there's just so much more too that I want to do. I haven't really worked with Sasha Banks or Oscar or you know I haven't done I haven't done much with the new NXT talent like Shayna and Rhea and you know some of the the girls that are coming up like Bianca. I want to work with those girls too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and 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 I think it's so cool. You're one of the few who. Really, I mean, and Alicia Fox was too, and she's not like active at this moment. But you're real. You guys were the only ones who really were around. Yeah. In the last, I mean, the Bellas were, but now they're not here. Yeah. Either. So you're sort of the last of the the ones who were in the Divas era. Yeah. And are now fully a part of this right women's movement that's in WWE. A great point. Um. So that's an important role to play too, because yeah. you've seen your level of appreciation is yeah. that much higher because you saw 
every version of what it's yeah. been like for women in the I, WWE. I've been a part of 45 second matches. I've been a part of diva dance offs. I've been a part of best body contests. I've been a part of everything. And, and the, the truth of the matter is, which, which WWE talks about all the time, is the, the industry has just evolved. You know, when I first started, we weren't, it was like when I debuted in WWE, we just kind of, the attitude era just kind of ended. So we were in this new era called the divas era. You know, which now we we coined that term with it, but like we, we were just all of a sudden told, hey, girls, you're going to be called divas. And so we just did what we were told because that's what we were told to do. We just wanted a chance. And I remember talking to Beth Phoenix about it. And Beth, of course, Beth Phoenix is, you know, a WWE Hall of Famer, one of, I think, one of the greatest female professional wrestlers in the history of WWE. She was amazing. And she would always, I would always say to Beth, like, I don't know how to do these best body contests. Like, I'm built like my dad. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I can't dance. Like, I dance like my dad. <laughs> <laughs> and Beth would say to me, just fake it until you make it. Just wear a turtleneck, be a heel, you know, put on a lot of jewelry, wear a sarong. Like, she and I would just fake it until we made it. And then all of a sudden, like, one day women's wrestling was embraced. And then we're like, we're ready to just, we're ready. And that's the greatest feeling is when you're really ready. And I, I tweeted that before our match in Saudi Arabia. I said, we're ready. We were ready. The people were ready. The company was ready. It was like this beautiful, perfect storm of, like, readiness. <laughs> um, r Really quickly, you mentioned her name, and I just think she has so much potential to be iconic as Rhea Ripley. Um, do you see what I see? Like, yeah. someone who has the tools at her age, the... It factor. She's everything. She really does. Like I, I, I see. I don't know where what the ceiling is for her, but it yeah. seems like she's someone that you're like. She could end up as a really, really special. I think, and and that's that's the secret is being cultivated, being nurtured, being put in situations where you're allowed to rise to the occasion, being paired with good people that help you rise. Especially when you're that young too. Yeah. Um, because it's easy, I think, for people to get excited and they get thrown in, and if yeah. you're not necessarily yep. ready, you can burn out. But she has all the tools. I think. I think as long as she stays the course and understands too that like certain things sometimes certain opportunities don't happen for a reason so like that's the one thing i always try to instill in the girls is patience like i think like even on the main roster like there's girls that are still waiting for a chance like sarah logan and Liv morgan and you know even dana brooke like who now she's on smackdown but like once you actually see them starting to like it's like it's almost like the hunger makes you better like i worked with sarah logan a couple weeks ago and she just impressed me so much i was like you are such a great like villain in the ring. She plays such a you know good heel, and um, I just was like, when you get your chance, when you finally get your chance, and it's hard because there are people yeah. that they came up with are already having their moment, yeah. you know, and it's like, well, when's mine but coming? Sometimes things happen, like life happens, situations right. happen, circumstances happen, and I think when you look at Rhea, I think like I think Rhea has an incredible look. Um, I think she has a passion for wrestling. I remember training with her before my match with Becky at SummerSlam. I went to um, the Performance Center and I told Sarah Del Rey, I said, give me 10 girls, give me your best 10 girls, or just give me whomever I can get my hands on, even if there's 20 girls, because there's so much, there's, there are a lot of talented women right now mm -hmm. at the PC. I said, just give me who you can, and I want to get in the ring with them, and I want to wrestle around with them for 45 minutes, we're going to put a timer on. And so everybody got in the ring with me, Deanna, Rhea, um, Shayna, just the girls got in the ring with me and we just moved around and wrestled. And I remember like wrestling Rhea and going, wow, I want to wrestle with her. Like yeah. she's really, really good. Yeah, there's a natural feel to what she does. But that's... she also has that presence because yeah. you can teach headlocks, you can teach drop kicks, you can teach clotheslines. But if you don't have that presence, like Rhonda, I felt like even though, you know, Rhonda's polarizing, either you love her or you hate her. But in the fact that I work so closely with her and you know, my husband, TJ Wilson, produced their match at, at uh, WrestleMania. So he worked very close with uh, Rhonda. Rhonda had, this, uh, Rhonda had this ability to emotionally connect with the audience. I think Rhea has that too. Yeah. Either you have it or you don't. You can teach the fundamentals of wrestling to anyone. But either you have that it factor or you don't, that ability to captivate an audience and make them feel something emotionally. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Now, before I let you go, t just tell tell me what was your experience um, getting back from Saudi Arabia? It was obviously an adventure. There's a lot of stories about what actually was happening, but the bottom line was you guys as talent ended up having quite the journey. So just take me through it from your perspective, what happened. I feel like my life is one big traveling journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it basically is. But for you, this I, is probably just an extended hiccup in that journey. I, but I live my life on an airplane, so I, it's like I was saying to Beth Phoenix, I have like, in one week I had 21 flights. Um, 
we boarded a flight. They told us to, to get off the plane because there was mechanical issues. So for me, if I ever hear that there's mechanical issues on a flight, I, I don't think about anything else other than my safety because I sure as hell don't want to be in the air when there's a mechanical, <laughs> mechanical issue. issue. Yeah, no, I'm good. Um, knock on wood, everything worked out. Um, for me, I <laughs> luckily had some great protein bars in my bag. There you go. Um, it, you know, I took some selfies with Lana in a, in a lobby. <laughs> how, and so how long did you end up waiting from the time you got on? How much later did you actually end up flying? Did you um, would not go to the next day? We, we After the show in Saudi, we went to the airport to, to board the flight, and then there was just a series of mechanical issues. So we were told by the flight attendants, hey, everybody has to deplane. So we all deplaned, and then they took us to a hotel. So we stayed at a five-star hotel, ate some more amazing hummus. Uh, <laughs> and for me, I just, I, we deal with so many travel issues all the time. So like I said, I, I was just told to deplane because there was mechanical issues, and that's that's basically the extent and of it. And you weren't going to be on SmackDown anyway. Um, so no, because I'm a raw talent. Since you're a raw talent now, it so, didn't, you, weren't in the, you didn't have the same sort of sense of urgency to get back. Yeah, I had an, I, I did have a sense of urgency to get back, though. In this, I, had, I was doing an event with Maria Shriver for the Women's Alzheimer's Foundation. On Saturday night? On uh, Saturday morning. Saturday morning. So, but for me, like, just staying with the group and just making sure that, you know, we all, we, we were all kind of in it together. Like, we, tra we traveled on a charter there so for me like being with being with everybody and staying in the group and just kind of you know waiting until they fix the situation because I, I I like it's knock on wood I've never been on in a situation on a plane where it's gone down or crashed or but I know you God, haven't had a Ric Flair moment I had, thank I was God just gonna bring yes. up Ric Flair. I I until you experience something like that the second that you hear from anyone especially the flight attendants who were working closely with us saying hey you guys have a situation here no matter what, if there is one ounce of a situation going on with anything on that plane, I don't want to be on it. Yeah. I want to get off of it, and I want to make sure that we can get on either another flight or wait until it's ratified. Because it's to me, you can't have 175 people in the air, and all of a sudden you go down. You know. So no, so no. so that was that was the long and the short of it. But um, I, I've you know I I I get it. I've been hearing everything and. It, it makes for a really interesting story. <laughs> yes. Well, one day, the whole story between what happened and then what happened on SmackDown and how different a show you got, we all got Which and then how well-received that show yeah. was is a very interesting... The whole thing's a very well, interesting 24 hours. Yeah, because I, I, I know even with the SmackDown crew, like, they were cutting it close to getting... Or the... Not SmackDown crew. Sorry, the NXT crew. They yeah, they were, barely made it. Yeah, they... So, and, so, and, and, so, like I said, plane issues, you know... <laughs> in general, it was just a, yeah. it's a really wacky yeah. couple of days. Um, but luckily, SmackDown was awesome. Yeah, it turned out Smackdown amazing. SmackDown was awesome. Last question before I let you leave. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of conversation and fun in the wrestling business around the emergence of AEW, and there now being two companies that people get to watch, and it's reminding people of the late 90s to a lesser extent. Yeah. Have you gotten to watch what's happening on Wednesday nights on, in your competition? I watch everything. TJ, my husband, is a Yeah, he consumes it all. Yeah. And, uh, well, because he watches everything, we watch everything. Yeah. And I don't, like, I've got friends across the board in both Comp like in mean, every wrestling promotion in the world. So what do you think? So do you think do you think it's a decent show? I I enjoy I'm enjoying wrestling right now. Like I feel like it's an exciting time. And I have friends that are in AEW like Britt Baker and you know there's girls that I I really like. I love I support women's wrestling. You know we're TJ and I are really good friends with Chris Jericho. My dad actually that was the last um, interview that he did was with Jericho's uh, podcast with Jericho. By the yeah. way, I think Jericho is having. A, a true resurgence. Like, I thought two years ago Jericho was cool, um, but I was like, he's getting near the end. This Jericho, this version of how obnoxious he is, yeah. is a new, he's he's added another wrinkle. You know, like a really, like every savvy vet, he's added yeah. a new wrinkle to his character. A new wrinkle of, of obnoxiousness. Yes, but it really it, is great. It's so great because, like, you know, again, Jericho has the skills to pass on his knowledge, and you look at, like, you look at NXT and it's like, I'm excited about Wednesday nights. I'm excited because, and Stephanie McMahon said this, competition makes everybody better. And you look at, you know, when we, were, we weren't we were able to get back home from being in Saudi Arabia, we were dealing with those delays. NXT stepped up and they helped us. And, and them being on that big stage with SmackDown on Fox, now I feel like it's going to help their show on Wednesday. Yeah. So between, there's a whole lot of wrestling going on. Between Monday Night Raw, mm -hmm. you have Total Divas on Tuesday, which, you know, sometimes we wrestle on that show too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wednesdays, you have two shows. You have show, By the way, show I can't on. believe Graves is on episodes of Total Divas. What? 
a <laughs> D-bag. I can't believe this guy. Gra you of know all what? the people to end up, Graves I would have thought he would have. side to him. I, oh, believe me, I know. I just thought Graves would have been like, I'm not going to do. You know, listen, I know what's going on with us. I'm not going to go on Divas. And well, then I see the commercial, and he's like, hey, babe, blah, blah, blah. I, that's the, I got to tune in to see Graves on Divas. You never know what's going to happen between Daniel Bryan and, you know. You know what? Know, it's a good point, but Daniel Bryan. Yeah, I just I didn't want to give him a hard time. Graves. Yeah, this you just is, want to give him. A hard I time. really can't believe a, D, a, a total divas guy. I did not see it. Well, you never know. Sometimes there's those there's those guys like again TJ. I never thought TJ would be on total. Divas. That's a very good point. And if the Usos, if yeah. the Usos and TJ, yep. could be on total divas. Oh, you know what? what? I, now that I think about it, Corey's not really worthy of total divas. <laughs> <laughs> there's been great all time greats on there. Um, Natty, great seeing you. Oh, I'm so happy I was able to stop in. Uh, yeah, me too. And I'm happy you're back from Saudi. Arabia yes, and uh, you can see her tonight uh, Nassau Coliseum Long Island go buy your tickets right now at the box office or Ticketmaster I'll see you next time okay yes thank you so much <laughs>